And on that note, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brian Fagan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. These are two of my three beasts. You may have noticed in the brochure, there's a picture of me sitting with a dog. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have a dog. That picture was taken in England by my wife, and the dog decided to be part of the picture. Could we get rid of him? No. I can't have a cat. Dogs, my cats would disapprove. The cat at the top is a Maine Coon cat, Atticus Caticus Catamore Moose. And the one below, the little tabby, is a uh, called Pipette. But ladies and gentlemen, they mean it about cell phones. If you have cell phones, turn them off, because I scream if people use them. Uh, why? Because, as you notice, I've got no notes. And my mind is running about two minutes ahead of where we are now. And it's very important. If a cell phone rings, it shatters my concentration. Much as I love you, put your cell phones away. Archaeology has this image of spectacular discoveries, lost civilizations, incredibly old humans, adventure and excavation in remote lands. This was true three quarters of a century ago or more. We were larger than life, largely because people like Louis Leakey on the wife worked with shoestring budgets all by themselves. And the discoveries they made, like Tutankhamun on the left, or the standard at Ur of the Coldies in the middle, or Zinjempathus on the right, were discoveries larger than life. And inevitably, they produced the Hollywood myths. <laughs> you may be interested to know that the character of Indiana Jones was thought up by a 65-year-old retiring librarian in George Lucas's library. She's the most unlikely person to have invented Indiana Jones, but she did. These are the stereotypes that are popular, and they're nonsense. Because archaeology today is an extremely specialized and sophisticated subject. And this is the most, and most important point. Why does archaeology matter? Because it is the only way of studying human societies and how they've changed and how we became more diverse that exists. History deals with documents. We deal with three million years of human existence. And this is why we are important. Let me give you an example. How many of you here have been to Angkor Wat in Cambodia? Oh, you're well traveled. Isn't it amazing? It is a staggering place. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a chance to go, go. It is incredibly large. It makes places like Westminster Abbey or Stonehenge look like village shrines. And for years and years, it's been studied as a temple. They've studied the sculpture. They've studied the architecture and the layout. What they never studied was the landscape. Why? Because it was all under forest. And walking through forest trying to find archaeological sites is extremely difficult, near impossible. But then in recent years, thanks to laser imaging from satellites and helicopters, they've now been able to look at Angkor Wat, you can see it on the right there, in the context of its landscape, over 20 square miles. And we found that this was a huge dispersed city which had canals, streets, and hundreds, if not thousands, of small houses, some of which you can see on the right. And this sort of research is revolutionizing things like our understanding of Maya civilization, of colonial plantations in the East Coast, of Angkor Wat, Indian civilizations and Chinese civilizations. There is a revolution where we're really beginning to see the impact of humans on the broader landscape. And then there's another thing we're beginning to do. Thanks to modern high-tech science and medicine, we now know more and more about individuals. Instead of just writing about skeletons, in a way we're becoming biographers. 
The gentleman on the left, known as the Amesbury Archer, was found in England about 15 years ago. Just a skeleton and the remnants of his equipment. His equipment suggested that he was a little unusual. He had some ornaments and so on. But his bones and the chemistry of the isotopes in his bones show us that this man who lived about 2500 BC was brought up in Germany. They've been able to track the geology. That's what archaeology can do now. It's beginning to write the history of individuals. People, where they lived, what their malnourishment was, and so on. If you look at the gentleman in the right, which is a rather romantic rediscovery of the famous Otzi, the Iceman, in the Alps, found in 1991, teams of experts have studied his frozen body, and they've been able to show that he suffered from malnutrition at the age of 9, 14, and 18. They even know which valley from the south he came from because of the seeds in his intestine. They've been able to reconstruct how he was killed by an arrow in his shoulder and how he had a fight with four different men with a dagger. Why? Because his DNA is preserved, the DNA of these people. And from this, we've got a portrait of a man between about 35 and 40 who lived about four to 5,000 years ago. Again, we are biographers. The accident of preservation in that case gave us his soft organs. And then, of course, on the right, Ramesses II, who died at the age of 92, having fathered over 100 children. He was discovered by accident. His mummy had been moved from his tomb. It was discovered in 1881. And in recent years, French scientists have reconserved it, and they've been able to show what diseases he had. We know more about the medical history of Ramesses II and his troubles with dental abscesses than he knew himself. We are, in a way, becoming biographers. All sorts of things we're studying. Gender, the role of men and women, indigenous rights, migrations, and community archaeology, lower left, where we're working increasingly with local communities. Because one of the important things to remember is that all of you, whoever you are, all of us are stakeholders in the past. And the importance of this center is that it is a place that will really foster this diverse stakeholders, not only Indians, but ourselves. And the real thing you have to remember about archaeology is that it isn't about today. It's not about the past. It's about the future of humanity. Because many of the things in the past, of course, we can't tell you what the future is going to be like. But we can tell you some of the things that people have been successful at and unsuccessful. But above all, we give everybody a much greater understanding of ourselves and our predecessors. And a classic, rather silly example, actually, is the study of modern urban garbage. And there have been serious studies, for example, much of it in Tucson, Arizona, of the discard patterns of, say, cat food. And things like that, where we really get revealing pictures of what sorts of things people throw out and what they do not. And this sort of work, oddly enough, is very relevant to cities like Nineveh in the past, where they have never been able to really interpret the bones. Now they can. And now I'm going to go off on another tangent. And this is me, because I want to explain how I got doing what I do now, because this is relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, which is not all going to be archaeology. Back in 1960, as a very young man, I excavated this site. It's a mound between AD 650 and 1100 in the highlands of Central Africa in Zambia, 300 yards long, 200 yards wide, and 12 foot deep. And my challenge with this was to reconstruct 
not only the date and the stratigraphy, but how the people lived and why. And I was the only archaeologist within 300 miles. And I had African laborers. And they were very interested in what I did. And rapidly it became clear to me that I wasn't studying archaeology. I was studying the history of the people who lived there, who were the remote ancestors of the people who were working with me. And this changed my life because I happened to get into this just at the time as there was a in great interest in tropical Africa, in the history of Africa, in African nations becoming independent. And I got involved with a group of historians who made me realize that most of African history, because most written records only go back a hundred years, was archaeology. And this site actually got into school textbooks in Zambia before it was published at a technical level in the archaeological literature. And increasingly, I got involved in writing for the public, because this was supported by the public. And that was something I had to take seriously. The people who dug there were stakeholders in this site, as I was. But then I got involved with another site, which was in an area called the Zbwembe Valley, the Zambezi Valley, again in Central Africa. This valley is 1,200 feet above sea level, 600 miles from the Indian Ocean, surrounded by plateaus at 4,000 feet. A cold day here is 72 degrees. And it is a brutal climate in which these people, the Gwembe Tonga, were subsistence farmers. They lived from one harvest to the next, from one rainfall season to the next. And living among them for a year or more was a very revealing experience, especially in the end of the dry season, about now, September, October. Every day the temperatures rose, 105, 106, 107. It was so hot that the cattle stood still in the shade. If you sat in the shade and moved a finger, you sweated. Tempers rose. And in this very hot weather, the people went out, burnt the undergrowth that covered their gardens, spread the ash on the gardens, and then they waited for the rain. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. The rain is like it is here, very localized. You might get all day rain in one place, but seven miles away there was none at all. And every afternoon, the crowds would build on the western horizon. The temperature would rise, temperatures, tempers flared, there was lightning. There might even be a few drops of rain. And it didn't fall. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And then one magical day it rained, and they planted. And then they waited, and they waited, and they waited. If there was good rain, the maize and the millet came up in the fields, and people were happy. But two of the three years I was there, the rains failed. By Christmas, there was hunger. By the spring, there was starvation. And you never, ever forget seeing children with malnutrition. This had an absolutely indelible impression on my life. And it made me realize what the past was like. It was very high risk, it was brutal, and people were incredibly ingenious at surviving. And to have done this really colored the whole way I've looked at archaeology ever since. For me, it's been a global subject. I got very tired of reading about Europe or North America or the Maya when there's a whole world to play with. Because one of the issues that came to me when I started teaching was I was struck that my students, who were mostly suburban students from Los Angeles, really had no perspective on any other society. Their greatest adventure was going to McDonald's on the corner. 
one laughs. But it was a serious problem because the fundamental problem to me that archaeology studies is why are we similar and why are we different? And we're much more similar than we're different. And one of the most important things about your center here, and it's so nice to meet somewhere where things are being done, is that you will address this problem. And you will do it with stakeholders. And the other thing I realized, and this has been a major theme in my life, is that a great deal that archaeology does is involved with what you would call sustainability. And one of the classic examples of this, there were two, are in South America. One is in the Altiplano up in Bolivia, where people used to grow potatoes. And this went into disuse, and an archaeologist at the University of Pennsylvania had the brilliant idea of digging some old fields and reconstructing them and planting potatoes with water around them. And the result was that the crops grew and were protected against frost. And now hundreds of Bolivian farmers are doing this. Why? Because of archaeology. In the Amazon, the same thing. On the right, you can see some fields which are using the basic same principles. Don't ever tell me that archaeology is a luxury. It isn't if you have the right mindset. And one of the things about your center is that it has the right mindset. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting used to this thing. And the big thing about sustainability, and here we start talking about climate change, is a very interesting question. How did people of the past rise to challenges, solve problems like drought that we still encounter today? To me, one of the absolute classic examples it's Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. How many of you have been there? Good. Well done. If you haven't been, go. It is truly a magical place. And it is a place which is very humbling because you realize the scale of the Native American achievement. And the greatest of these sites is Pueblo Benito. But we're very lucky at Chaco because we have extremely precise tree ring and other data which give us some idea of the rainfall and drought. And you can see there the figures where the big droughts were. And the big one in the 12th century particularly. And it was then that the population of Chaco dispersed. And there was this big debate which started by people saying, oh, Chaco collapsed. You're not giving people credit for what they actually did, because deeply entwined in the Native American Pueblo Indian ancestral Pueblo traditions are oral traditions which are involved with movement, with response to drought and plenty, and rainfall and plenty, and a great reliance on kin relationships with outlying communities away from Chaco. And it seems most likely now that we know more and it's multidisciplinary research that the people gradually dispersed from Chaco and moved to places where they had kin. Because the whole thing about ancient life, and it's very interesting when you could have a kin Katrina, for example, the most important thing that really helped with Katrina, and it's probably helping in Houston, are ties of family and connections. And that's one thing archaeology really teaches us. And it gives us an enormous respect for the achievement of the ancestral Pueblo. Now I'm going to start talking about this and about climate change on a rather different angle. Because the thing about archaeology is it goes right up in the 19th century. There are people who are digging uh, 19th century Victorian railroad stations. And they've even dug the movie set of Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments in Central California, which was pulled down in 1921. So archaeology is very eclectic. But one of the big ones, one of the big studies, is that of the North Atlantic cod trade. Ladies and gentlemen, if ever you get a chance to go to Norway, 
Go to the north, go to the Lofoten Islands, or go to Newfoundland. And in both places, on the shores of bays, you will see row after row of wooden wax. And those wax were used to dry cod. Gaddis Mohua, you see him up there on the tef, top left. And there's a village in the Lofotens, which is a cod village. You can just see a rack on the right. And down bottom left are cod drying on the windy, cold, cool winds of the spring in the sun. This richness of cod in the North Sea, in the North Atlantic, and in Newfoundland was one of the biggest trade commodities of the 20th, of, of the second millennium. This was, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble, there we go, was an enormous trade. But there were questions asked about it. One of them was, when did it start? And a remarkable research in Iceland, of all places, looking at cod deposits in villages. They've now got so sophisticated that they actually can measure from bones and establish the size of the cod, which were traded. And they found about 1,100. Suddenly, they were concentrating on a size of cod at about this size. Bone after bone, fish had become a commodity. And the history of the cod fisheries after that is a constant battle against sustainability. But in fact, archaeology has shown that sustainable cod fisheries in the North Atlantic really became unsustainable as early as the 16th century. Today, the cod fishery is closed down in a hope that it will recover. But probably the one where archaeology has a huge role to play is climate change. We looked very briefly at Chaco. Now I'm going to look at the attacking ocean, which he was talking about. This is really an attack. In 1932, a North Sea trawler dredging for cod and other fish in the North Sea on a shallow bank brought up a lump of peat. And when it dropped on the deck, this bone point on the right fell out. It was shown to the experts, and they realized that this was identical to points found in Denmark and England. And we know now that's about 8,000 years old. And today, with sophisticated remote sensing, we know that until about 5,500 BC, believe it or not, the North Sea was dry land. So was the English Channel, which was a large estuary. And this was established by remote sensing using data from oil companies. And they've shown that after about 12,000 BC, the sea level rose rapidly, and these huge areas of what were then wetlands slowly became marshy, then damp. And this was a very, very favorable environment for people who fished for shallow water with canoes, pike, and other fish. And it is estimated by the experts that thousands of people lived on the North Sea shores under there, and the sea would have risen so fast because it was a very flat landscape, and even an inch would bring water horizontally, that somebody living in that bay with a life expectancy of maybe 25, by the time he died or she died, they wouldn't recognize the place because it was flooded. Very dynamic environment. And the way they responded, and this is important, was by moving. They simply moved to higher ground. On the other hand, if you take the Nile Delta, and the Nile is like a, flower, a, sh a shaft of green going up to the Mediterranean, and then at the top you've got the lotus flower, the Delta, flat. That was the granary of the pharaohs. 
That was where they grew the grain. And that was where the unification of Egypt, shown by the Pharaoh Nama killing a prisoner in 3000 BC, that was where Egypt was unified. And for thousands of years, the Nile Delta was the granary. And then in 1880 and in 1900 and 1960, the British built Aswan dams. Now, the whole of ancient Egyptian civilization depended on the annual flood, which inundated the valley, and then the water fell and people planted on the wet ground. And this was not infallible, but it was a barometer which allowed people to harvest grain in large quantities and store it for thousands of years. And when the Aswan Dam, the last one, was built, the annual flood stopped. And the only way water comes down there is through the dam. And now sea levels are rising and population is rising. If you look on the left, you can see the difference between a half meter rise and a four meter rise. One of which is the flooding, flooding of Alexandria. Now, you're not talking about a couple of thousand people. You're not talking about 10,000 people. You're talking about millions. And look at Cairo in the bottom left. And the groundwater is becoming increasingly salinized. And a major social crisis is arising in, in Egypt simply because they can't grow enough food. The silent elephant in the room is rising city populations. And another one. And why am I telling you this in the context of archaeology? Because it's important you understand why we need to know the background of these things. If we take the country of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is basically an enormous river estuary where the highest ground is about 38 feet above sea level. And it's at the top of the Bay of Bengal. And these enormous tropical cyclones barrel into the bay and like hurricanes they bring storm surges, big storm surges. Here it is, this is the coast. These people even today live at sea level and much of the year they live in their boats. And about five years ago, I went to a fascinating talk by a retired major general from Bangladesh. And he talked about the issue of rising sea levels. And he was beautifully measured and sober with data and everything, had a wonderful English accent. I congratulated him after one on his presentation, his accent. He said, my dear boy, I went to Sandhurst Military Academy. They taught me how to speak English properly. <laughs> Anyhow, very British voice. But what was really sobering, and you could hear a pin drop in the audience, was he said that within 50 years, that's nothing, they're going to have to move between 10 and 15 million coastal dwellers. Why? Because the land is gone. And these people deeply attached to their land. Where are they going to go? India doesn't want them, Myanmar doesn't want them, and there isn't enough high ground. And if you look at Dakar, which had one and a half million inhabitants in 1970, and eight and a half million in 2008, and will have 21 million by 2025, and the groundwater in Dakar is now being destroyed, you can understand that some historical understanding of this is terribly important. Because Today, one of the biggest problems we face is the problem of ecological refugees. And incredible though it may seem, there were no international policies to deal with this problem. One of the lessons of the past is that we've never really thought very far into the future. We think of the next election. We don't think about our children and our grandchildren. 
And if there was one thing it, you have to do it with, it is climate change. Not because it's humanly caused or not. That's one of the things the media love. The real issue is, yes, we live in a warming world. And we better take it seriously. Because the past shows us that the solutions like movement that we used before simply aren't viable. Look at the Maldives. This is the capital of the Maldives, Mahe. It's walled in by a wall built at vast cost by the Japanese. Will it endure in a hundred years? No. Where will they go? Or where were these people from Southeast Asia going to go? So it's very sobering. And you've got villages in Alaska which are going into the ocean. And you can't deny that they're not going somewhere because they have. And these people have lived there for thousands of years and their knowledge of the environment is priceless and nobody is taking any notice of their knowledge. Because one of the other things I've learned is just how incredibly complex <coughs> environments are. And one of the things you learn from archaeology is how incredibly detailed the knowledge these people have of their environment. I walked once with an African farmer friend of mine through his land and he said, of course, in a week I'm going to move my cattle there, and in a month I'm going to move them there. And I said, how do you know? And he looked at me. He said, my boy, you don't know the environment. Those grass that are growing there are there for another two weeks. After that, we go to those ones, and our cattle like them. Makes you think. And then, of course, there is the whole issue of damage to the past. And this is the whole issue of cultural heritage. Cultural heritage has become a very hot topic, particularly with the development of the jumbo jet and the cruise ship. And what I want to talk about now is enjoying the past. The past, in a way, is a very impersonal thing. It's artifacts and ruins. But actually, ladies and gentlemen, and that's one thing that's wonderful about this center, it's one word. It's people. We are homo sapiens. We're the wise people. We plan. We innovate. We rise to challenges. And the question of questions is, are we going to rise to the challenge of the future? And the answer to that lies partly in how much we understand the past and how much we admire it. And one of the fastest growing segments of the tourist business is cultural tourism. This is Hadrian's Wall in northern England. It is the most gorgeous place. I took this on a day of the first snow. And you go over there, and earlier in the day, the clouds were low over the wall. And the wind was blowing, and you, the, the mist was blowing over, and there was rain. You could see about 100 yards. And it was very easy if you shut your eyes to imagine a legionnaire in his cloak watching closely in case raiders came over looking for cattle, taking advantage of the bad weather. For a moment it all came alive. That's what cultural tourism is. Or the city of Tehatiwakan. On the left there is the Pyramid of the Sun, one of the great monuments of the world. And this city, which held 220,000 people about 1,500 years ago, is now an empty shell. But the scale of it beggars the mind. And if you go there, ladies and gentlemen, it's like going to the pyramids of Giza. I want you to stand and look up at the pyramid. Because it was very carefully designed to diminish you in the presence of the gods. There was nothing a lot of these ancient societies and civilizations didn't know about drama, public performance, and the power of the gods. And when you look at Chaco Canyon, or Aztec, or Mesa Verde, you have to realize that there was there a very powerful relationship between the people who lived there, the forces of nature, and the ancestors. We live in a society where we pay very little notice of the ancestors. But one of the things we need to do and why archaeology is important is that all sorts of histories of humanity, 
of different types, shapes, and sizes. There are people who believe the world never had a linear history. There are people who believe it had a circular history. There are people who are completely mesmerized by the passage of the seasons. Ladies and gentlemen, all these views of the past are correct. <coughs> it just happens what the values you were brought up with were. Or this one here. And this is a classic example of how badly we do this. And again, why this center is important. This is the stadium at Olympia. The guides take you there. These guides are trained. And they tell you it was built in X, and it held a Y number of people, and it was used for this and that. And they show you the starting blocks where the one figure is falling. And they show you the passageway at the bottom right where the people entered the arena. But I want you just to shut your eyes for a moment and just think about this. Imagine a race. Imagine the crowd standing on those banks with the judges in their white cloaks in the little square enclosure on the right. Imagine people jostling, people yelling, people fighting, people drunk, people drinking from wine skins, and the lowing of oxen and the smell of meat cooking from the sacrificial oxen. And then imagine the silence as the people run, and then the yelling and the shouting, and then the fighting afterwards as people quarrel who won. That's what this is about. It's the living past. It's people. And they don't tell you that. And it's a terrible loss. Many years ago, I went to the great amphitheater Epid Epidaurus in Greece. How many of you have been there? Any of you? Good. Did you enjoy it? Yes. It's an amazing place. And it's huge. And the last time I went there, there was a German professor there with a small group of students. I think they were students. And he walked in. It was the evening, a still evening. And he made them sit about halfway up. And he recited Euripides. And the word Pema just echoed around. It was fabulous. And you realized that that place crowded really was a theater. Now there were people saying, oh, that's nonsense. It's not. It was built to impress, to perform. And at the top, you had to be able to hear what the people were saying down there. This was enormously important. It was emotional. And ladies and gentlemen, that isn't just a sterile amphitheater. It is a place that saw brilliant drama. And if ever you have a chance to hear a Greek play in one of these amphitheaters, go and do it. It's fabulous. You may not understand a word. That's not the point. But it's just the atmosphere. Because the past lives. And finally, here's another look at it. How many of you have been to an instance in British Columbia? Any of you? Ah, one man. Two. Did you enjoy it? This is an incredible place. It's an abandoned Haida village from the 1870s, which is a forest of totem poles. You see some of them there in a small tidal bay behind the beach. And back in the 50s, archaeologists removed considerable numbers of them and took them to the BC Provincial Museum in Victoria. This was a travesty because these are ancestral poles and the Native Americans argue they should stay there and gradually they should revert to the forests because this is the realm of the ancestors. And these are things we don't really think about. We're beginning to think about them now as we look more closely at Native American oral traditions and other things. It really is important to understand. 
And this is why your center is important. And that's why archaeology is changing very profoundly. It isn't just the traditional digging of sites, although that is vital because the archaeological record is being destroyed very rapidly. It's about people. People's triumphs, people's tragedies, people's passionate interest in their ancestry, in their passionate interest in preserving their past. And one of the big challenges we face now is sites like the pyramid, or even an instance, which are being overwhelmed with people who want to see them. More people go to the pyramid of Giza in a month than probably went there in 20 years in Egyptian times. Angkor Wat has visitor counts in the millions, and it's being worn out. The palace of Minos, Knossos, and Crete, the same thing. So the challenges that face us are simply enormous. And this is an extraordinarily important time to be in archaeology because the future of the past depends on the decisions we make and our children make. Because if we don't make them, by the time our grandchildren come and the stakeholders, whoever they are, don't make them, it'll be gone. Because archaeology isn't like a tree. You can't grow it again. When the temple of Poseidon at Sudion is destroyed, it's gone. And to go there at sunset is special. And if you go, look for the inscription of Lord Byron on one of the columns. Because the past is all kinds of different things. What I've done this evening is covered a very broad range of subjects. I really haven't been in detail. I've been superficial. But if I've given you a few things to think about, then I've done something useful. Because does archaeology matter? Hell yes. And if you don't think it is, you shouldn't be in this room. Because it's one of the most important things we've got to do is preserve the past for the future. And my last picture, which is rather nice, apparently has vanished. It was a picture of Atticus Caticus Catamor Moose on the sleep on top of one of our kitchen cabinets. Thank you very much.